Uh, Mariana asked, um, why is there a pension law? Well, there are many laws. So I suppose the easiest and cutest answer to the question is there are many llamas, so why shouldn't there be a pension law? But that doesn't really answer the question. Um, I should have my notes from my testimony a week ago today. Wow, so much has happened. Um, but I don't, or I have my testimony. A student The founder of the Girupa order of Tibetan Buddhism, which is the perspective from which I'm speaking uh, in the sections that we're reading now, was a person by the name of Tsongkhapa, other longer names. His dates were 1357 to 1419. And one of his students was his nephew, Hinden Trup. Now, Tsongkhapa himself established a monastery at Ganden, and which is southeast of Plaza, nowadays by land cruiser. Uh, it's about two hours. You go by foot, it takes a little longer. <laughs> Although Galen Rao, who took the famous picture of the Dalai Lama's Winter Palace with the rainbow, maybe one in the department somewhere, I don't know where I've seen it recently. Anyway, um, he started running down the mountain from Ganden when we started in the Land Cruiser. And uh, of course, when we arrived at the bottom, he wasn't there. And so the, the driver waited. But we tried to convince the driver that Galen was ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, going on foot in a mountain, at least going down. <laughs> he should say, you, you don't have to go like this. The lane cruiser has to go like this. <laughs> I remember there was one woman who wanted to uh, get out of the land cruiser and walk as we were going up, just because it was so steep. But Gundan's a marvelous place. It's, uh, it's very isolated. You can see why he built a monastery there. Uh, with a tremendous views all around. The circumambulation path that is so steep on the back, well, I, I, I get vertigo. So, so steep. I don't know how steep it was, actually. <laughs> I was crawling back. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. Now, that's southeast of, of Plaza. And then west of Plaza, his nephew established a, in Shi, uh, Shigaze. These are my spellings. Make it a little easier to pronounce, I hope. She got said. Um, he built a monastery called Tashirun. The, the, this mark means high, Tashi. Tashi Kimbo. So we're talking 15th century, right? Now, um, Gendon troops, Gendon troop, so he founds this monastery, <laughs> makes him the abbot of the monastery. He's very learned. And Podong, who is one of the people who's mentioned in here, that we're going to look into his view. Uh, chapter number 11, Podong Chole Namgyal's Challenge, page 170. This has no more than a title because I haven't done the chapter yet. But I'll do something and, and read something to you at the time. Now, Podong Chole Namgyal apparently was so amazed at Gindan Troop's uh, erudition 
that he called him uh, Pen Chen. Now Pen uh, is from Pendika, okay? Pandita means Pan is from Pancha. So somebody who is skilled in the five branches of knowledge. So a, a great scholar. So in India, Maha Pandita is great scholar. In Tibetan, Pan Chen, Chen is the is Maha, the Indian Maha. That doesn't make him the first Panchen Lama. You have to get that straight, okay? Doesn't make him that. He, but that's how he got to be called Panchen. Many people are called Panchen. So now the Panchen Lama is, stems from this, but the important point is that he was not the first Panchen Lama. One of his successors but not reincarnations was then singled out as the Benjen Lama. Are you with me? One of his successors as abbot of the monastery, all of the abbots of the monastery <coughs> henceforth, I suppose we could say whether they were great scholars or not, were called Benjen. And one of those scholars became the Benjen Lama. Now, can and true, yeah, as I said before the Senate subcommittee, this is a complicated story. It's clear, but it's complicated. I'm not going to tell it today. I'll leave it for the record. You know, it goes into the congressional record. You can look it up. It's probably in there already. So, his, uh, so he, Gendon Troop himself reincarnates. And like, and but doesn't go on as as the abbot of this monastery. Other people do, who are then called Benchen Lama, right? Not Benchen Lama, Benchen. You know, they're called Benchen. You with me? Now he reincarnates, and I think it's the third um, who is Sunam Gyal. Who said third? Yes. Did you read my testimony? No. Yeah, I think I'm the source of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so his, you could say, second incarnation, but the third in the line, is Sunam Gyatso, who um, it's, I always saw it as, well, anyway, it's one of the Khans, Mongolian Khans, uh, Gushri Khan or Altan Khan, and they may, may be the same person gave the name of Dale to. So now you see, this person who is the, the source eventually of the name of Benchen Lama, really by his reincarnation, became the Dalai Lama. So you see, actually, when the Chinese make any sort of claim that they had something to do with the, with the naming of the Benchen Lama and Dalai Lama, there is just, it's, you know, it's total fabrication. Now, Dale, for those of you who are studying Tibetan, is this. Just so you get some <coughs> idea on pronunciation. It's not Dalai, although I myself, you know, I slip into da Dalai. It's Dalai, and it's a long Da. Da, hi, Dalai. Dale. I just said Dale. It's Dale. <laughs> this means A, not I. But anyway, it came into English as Dale. <clears throat> it's a Mongolian word meaning ocean, which was a translation of a name that he, that one of the names I presume that he already had, which was Gyatso. <clears throat> ocean. Ah, it was Altan Khan. Yes. yes. Correct me. Okay. I dare. <laughs> 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 yes.
Yes. No. So you get Mongolians teaming up with Tibetan lamas to, um, in a priest patron relationship, you know, you have a lama and a warrior. And of course, the lama is trying to get the warrior not to beat up on his people and is also disarming the warrior. And you have to remember that in the uh, 8th century, the Tibetan Empire extended even to Xi'an, Chang'an, then the capital of uh, China. We're going back, just jumping back to the 8th century. Now, the fifth Dalai Lama. <clears throat> With the help of Gushri Khan, unified Tibet and uh, took over the government. His teacher, his tutor, was the abbot of Dashi Lumbo, right? His teacher was the abbot of Dashi Lumbo. <coughs> because it, it wasn't right, it wasn't getting the troops reincarnations that went on as the abbot of Dashi Lumbo. They were just successors by merit, by scholarship. His teacher was the abbot, and the fifth Dalai Lama announced that his teacher's reincarnation would be found. So from that point on, the abbot of Dashi Lumbo came to be a, reincarnate, a, a reincarnation rather than somebody else rather than somebody just recognized by merit, but a little kid <laughs> who's, who's uh, recognized as the reincarnation of the last ben Benchen Lama. Right? Do we think? Now, that abbot, the Dalai Lama's tutor, himself was a reincarnate Lama, that, that just means there were a few recognized before him. Everybody's reincarnated. There were a few recognized before him. So when his reincarnation was found, that reincarnation was called the fourth Benchen Lama. You with me? Even though it had nothing to do with Gendon Tru, except that he got the name Benchen because uh, Troop was such a great scholar. Are you satisfied, Mary? <laughs> I don't know, I don't understand how the fourth Dalai, the fourth Panchen Lama be. Was it Malik? Now you would think that when the, the fifth Dalai Lama's tutor was recognized, that this would then be the second, yeah. it's like the second Panchen Lama, yeah. okay? But he had a couple uh, important reincarnations before him. And even though they weren't abbots of Shigadze Monastery, they were so important that uh, uh, this child, then instead of being called the second, was called the fourth. I'm not sure everybody uses the same counting, because I've seen in, in other places different countings, like third or fourth. But if he fourth. was recognized as the, what is it, Toko? Or yes. Then why would I don't understand why he was stepped over for other abbots? Why he was stepped over? Well, I mean, yeah, if if they recognized him as the reincarnation of. Uh, well, he wasn't stepped over anymore. He became then the reincarnation became the abbot of Dashi Lumbo Monastery, and this new one that the Dalai Lama has recognized okay. automatically becomes the abbot of Dashi Lumbo Monastery. You know, but Tibetans are smart. They don't like let a little kid control the monastery. As the Dalai Lama said, <laughs> they didn't pay any attention to who it was. Of course, they paid some attention. Now, what was I going to say? Um, the fifth Dalai Lama obviously was very powerful. And for instance, the king of the western province had come into central Tibet and wreaked some havoc. So then in turn, in order to take over the country and so forth, he went into western Tibet and knocked the shit out of the king of Tsang. 
and his supporters, which down to the present day has all sorts of ripples of effects within Tibetan sects. He is strong, but his, the person following him, his next incarnation, as this Dalai Lama puts it, he did have deep religious understanding, although that many people question, but he was a failure politically. So then at that point, the great neighbor, uh, China, but you know, being ruled by Mongols, then being ruled by uh, Manchus, so by Mongolians and Manchurians, had more and more <coughs> influence in Tibet. And one of the things they did was around the time of the, I forget which Benjamin Lama it was, um, the emperor made him a bigger deal than he was before in order to act as a counterweight to the, to the Dalai Lama. But apparently, he just considered himself to be a big deal in Shigotse. Uh, he, not, he, didn't, he didn't try to, um, he really didn't try to like take over the country. But when Mao Zedong invited the Dalai Lama to Beijing, he invited the Benjen Lama and the Dalai Lama at the same time, like playing the same deal. So nowadays, when the Dalai Lama identifies the Benjen Lama, Beijing wants, a, wants some say in it because they're still, they still want to use the Benjen Lama as some sort of counterforce to the Dalai Lama. What I say to Beijing is, look, by the time the Benjen Lama grows up, the Dalai Lama is going to be a very old man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't make so much fuss, you know? It's just not very clever sometimes. It's probably more than you wanted to know about that. Thank you. Is there the first country in the world you ever No. It's supposed to be Kedro. Kedro? So. The second step of meditation on emptiness was not clear last time. If you wonder Entailment is like whatever is not produced from itself, another, both, or neither is not inherently produced. It's developing criteria for inherently existent production, developing conviction that all of the possibilities in terms of production um, are limited to these four. That's the second step. <clears throat> and then the following step is to consider these four, say, with respect to yourself. So this is, I am not produced from myself. Okay? So there'll be four parts. Myself, other, both. Neither would be causelessly. And if you could establish these four then, 
What's the conclusion? Is it clear to everybody what the conclusion is? What? You do not inherently Right. I do not inherently exist. So step number one is identifying the object of negation. Uh, a student of Tangela. Really? Yeah. Mm. You can imagine how people can uh, use reincarnations to show how their sect is better. In other words, you get some great figure of the Numa school like Long Timba, and you claim that he took rebirth as a Gilpa Lama. <laughs> or the other way I was uh, floored when I heard that. And then sometimes it, might, it would be done sincerely, and, and I presume uh, accurately. Then, with regard to, <laughs> to uh, what's his name, Harrison Ford, I did see face to face. <laughs> there was a reception, and I had to spend a little time talking. It's very difficult when he's got such a thick mustache. I was wondering if he <laughs> put it on so people couldn't quite identify him. Of course, he, he was the one who talked. Nice reception. The Dalai Lama was late for it because he was having dinner with Hillary Clinton. Uh, big hush-hush topic, but it's already known. Uh, so I'm, I'm not violating any. I wasn't supposed to know myself, but one learns these things rather quickly. Not, uh, but not with Bill Clinton. That's what, you know, these games. Yes, but he dropped he, in. <laughs> yes, again, Bill Clinton, as I understand it, I don't think it was any different from before, dropped in on the Al Gore meeting again. But so the 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 bone that they're throwing him, which is big, is to have dinner with Hillary Clinton. I mean that because she's I mean, she really she knows what she's doing. <laughs> and is that an opposition to my husband? Well, <laughs> and it was Harrison Ford's wife who arranged the dinner with Hillary Clinton. She's really, she's fabulous. She's she's just really knows what what she's doing and, and knows how to articulate what's going on in public. And, and Richard Gere was there, and I, I've known Gere from before, so we spent quite a bit of time talking. I'm giving my, my star. I'm trying to make, get, get a little stardust on me. <laughs> <laughs> and your inherently existing spot on your shirt. Oh, well, I noticed it that only afterwards. It was just bulging after. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, what's his name? Steven Seagal was at the reception. But I didn't, I was going to go over and say hello, and I didn't. He amazingly looks, I've never seen a movie of his, but the way I've seen him in previews, it's just the same. He's dressed in black. And he was that way at the, uh, last night at the, at Constitution Hall. Dressed in, that's very interesting. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to talk to him, so I didn't get any idea of uh, his background. So that's the star-studded studded part of my trip to Washington. <laughs> and oh, and by the way, I briefly met with a Dalai Lama. <laughs> Just before he met with the president, <laughs> with Al Gore. Did you see Nightline? Anybody see Nightline? He was on Nightline. There was a half-hour interview on that. I haven't seen anything.
which actually means identify this sense of I. This person gets angry or gets really happy when you, you know, <laughs> get to see Harrison Ford's face or, you know, whatever it is. I told him. <laughs> we had a good laugh over this. <laughs> And in fact, somebody reminded me, when he was giving his testimony, sweat was dripping off of his face. And, and I was told that his wife had said that his testimony pages were all wet with sweat. Isn't it amazing? Somebody who acts this much. How, you know, what complex creatures we are. Would, would uh, have a hard time appearing before a few senators and acting, you know, telling telling the story. <clears throat> so identifying this sense of I, who's real happy to get something said. And then identifying general criteria for determining that something does not, in, it's not inherently, well, in this case, I said inherently, produced, which would lead to, and thus, not inherently existing. And then you go about establishing over four more steps, right? They don't list out the conclusion because the conclusion follows so naturally from having done steps one through six. However, there is a step, there's a huge step. I mean, a hugely important step, but it's not some step that you have to do something different for. You're doing it here in one through six. And without any further cogitation, you understand I do not inherently exist. And as I was saying last time, this can't be a matter, even though we're going through it today in a, right, a rote fashion, just getting straight the outlines of it. Uh, when you go through it in detail and, and really tie yourself down to these four and then realize that these four don't work, the, the impact is uh, tremendous. Because it, this is the self who, from lifetime to lifetime, at least in this lifetime, has been involved in so many troubles, right? Worried about this, worried about that, happy about this, sad about that, seeking this. On the basis of it, getting into all sorts of trouble. One of the advantages I find of this kind of analytical meditation is that you're using a conceptual type of mind uh, to attack conceptuality, one type of conceptuality that is very fundamental, as opposed to meditations that can become just withdrawals. They give you some pleasure, give you some rest, which is very important. We certainly need it. We can't be frazzled all the time. But then when you return to your regular life, you're back to your old uh, self, completely convinced that all of these horrible things that happened to you, or whatever, and all ready to get pissed off, or, or excessively delighted, or, or whatever it is. So by using that conceptual mind itself, involving it, and in making it question itself, you are, you're doing something with that very mind that is so convinced in the midst of this emotional turmoil. This is not to say that there aren't other meditations that won't interfere, uh, but it's a particular virtue, I think, of this meditation. If you bring it to the point where 
these are really working on you. Now, in the case of the meditation we're talking about here, what is state, state step number two? I just drove back from Washington. <laughs> is that an excuse? What is essential number two or step number two? Mm -hmm. This one. Number two here. No, yeah, but in this, the way it's laid out in this book, it's not done by way of produced from self out of the both or neither. Same or different. Or... Same or different. So whatever is what? Not the same or different from what? That the object is not the same or different from the basis of, of designation the of that object. Okay? Or, so that's twofold version. And then? When you say same and different in that context, does that imply inherently the same and inherently different? Because when I went back over this, I found that that was my problem in trying to ascertain the entailment that those are the only two two possibilities is that I had to remind myself that it means inherently the same. Mm. You see what she's doing with her hand? <laughs> oh, so I don't know why she does the same movement with both of them. Inherently the same. Because it was but, like inherently. <laughs> inherently. Inherently the same and inherently different. Yes. And that's what really seems odd. Well, let's not jump to that. I wanted to ask the question of, so that's two, right? Whatever is not the same as or different from its basis of designation does not inherently exist. And we can put in the qualification inherently. Which then means, what will step, what will the rest of the steps be? You mean in the two, the twofold? Yes, when you do a twofold. It would be three, four, and then the fifth would be emptiness. And then the fifth would be like number seven. Right. If you can follow this, it's, it means you're getting the structure down. Anyone not follow? You know, I mean, it's, it's particularly interesting to me about this is what you're saying is in, I think, is in the second stage, there's this kind of, because this is a conceptually based meditation, it's using conceptuality to deconstruct itself, you have to place great faith in these two conceptual options. Mm. You have to you have to completely yes. go with those. It's yes. the only two possibilities. Yeah. And as I was saying last last, last time, wow. last time it may not be that you can place complete conviction right away. That there will be a chicken and the egg process in the meditation, such that it'll be some time later that you really do develop conviction. <laughs> It'll be faith for a while. Well, you will understand it later to have been faith. Now, what's the other way of doing same and different? Narajuna is five. Or? Seven. So then, step number two would have the complexity of whatever is not same as, different, dependent in two ways, possession, uh, collection, shape. Can we leave out one? Anyway, is not inherently existing. Different criteria. Looking at the same thing using different criteria but all inclusive criteria within that type of criteria. And then, how many steps will there be? If it's, if it's Chandra Kirti's way. Three through nine. Three through nine? <coughs> the ninth being? The tenth being. The tenth being? I do not inherently exist. Yep. 
Yes. Can you go over maybe um, the collection? Because that's one that I find quite interesting to study over and why it's really not the same. Well, now, let me first I'll turn to Amy's question. Same and different. Where the manipulative trick appears to be played here is that in according, can you see this blackboard? When I'm standing here, I can't see because of the, the way the light is. Can you go to the other side and see? Okay. That the way the reasoning works, whatever is the same is utterly the same. I mean, you could say one and the same. Exactly the same. You don't even have two things. It's so totally fused, right? And different means utterly different. Now, this is where the trick appears to be played. Define what same and different means in such a way that there's no possibility that I and mind and body could be the same or could be different. In other words, for instance, with different, you know, when you go through the reasonings, it says if I and mind and body are different, then you could get rid of mind and body and you'd have I sitting there. And they say, well, now that's dumb, isn't it? And you say, oh, yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And when they say, then they say, if mind and body and, and the eye are the same, then there are two eyes. Because you have mind, you have body. Do you have two eyes? No. That this, that kind of eye. I so said, well, that would be dumb, wouldn't it? Say you have two. Or if you say five aggregates, forms, feelings, discriminations, compositional factors, and consciousnesses, then you have five eyes. Oh, that's dumb. <laughs> and then you say, oh yeah, okay. Then you can't find it this way and this way, therefore I don't inherently exist. And it doesn't touch you at all. Because you have the sneaking suspicion, if not, you know, utterly convinced suspicion, of what do you call it, conviction, that the reasoning's been skewed. My own uh, teacher at the University of Wisconsin, Richard Robinson, called this a shell game. It was just a, a trick. Nobody held any of these opinions anyway. But what I found is that he was mistaken. Now what this means is that within the context of inherent existence, same ends up as meaning one, and different ends up as meaning utterly different, within the context of inherent existence. Now what that means is, within the context of the way we usually see ourselves, it cannot be within the context of some frozen universe, some philosophically constructed universe of inherent existence, that whatever is the same is so utterly one. What is different is so utterly different. But within the context of inherent existence, for, now what is it then? It all matters on what inherent existence means, which of course, Gloria said last time, you can't understand exactly how it differs from existence until you understand emptiness. <laughs> so, you know, is this another trick? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, one of the words that the Dalai Lama, this Dalai Lama used in 1972 is, I translate as pointability. Tsugu tusa. Tsugu meaning finger. Zusa means tsugu tusa, what you're pointing at. The thing that you're pointing at. 
So like you have a sense of, don't tell me. <laughs> you know, or you're pointing to your car, or you're pointing to you, you know, some, you know, you're near your apartment somewhere, you say, my apartment is over there. This, or you have some painting or a print or whatever in your apartment that is valuable to you, and, and uh, somebody has scarred it. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> your car. You know, I know where my car is. Right? No, no, it's okay. You know, I just corrected it because I moved it. I wanted it in shape because I had some some rice in the trunk. Like, well, rice isn't really gonna cook in the trunk. <laughs> Who wants to eat rice? Now, four. It seems to me that four, for instance, <coughs> my eye to have its own its own thing the way it appears to. And for mind and body to have their own thing, to be pointable, they would have to be such that you could remove mind and body and I still be there. Even though I don't think of it that way. Do you follow? And Songkhla says over and over again, we don't analyze this and say, oh yeah, yeah, I would have to fulfill this condition and that condition. But here we're examining it, given the way it's appearing. Would it have to fulfill these conditions? Or it would have to fulfill these conditions, given the way it's appearing, and given the way we're, we're assenting to that appearance? I think, to me, that makes sense. And that's, it's only then that the analysis works. Only then that the analysis works. Because otherwise, it appears to be a trick. And some people point out well, we never do hold ourselves to be exactly the same, you know, innately, exactly the same as mind and body. Some of us says, yes, we don't. But if we did inherently exist, then we would either have to be this way or that way, and, and you can eliminate both of those, but, but not easily. Because you'll start clutching to one or the other. Yes? I guess I didn't understand what you meant by given that it's... Given how it appears. How it appears, because it doesn't appear. But then you said this right after I had the question. It doesn't appear as either the same or different. So is the idea that first you're making this logical decision that if we're talking about inherent existence that an inherently existent I would have to be either exactly the same as or except utterly different from and then you're going on to get to say it again um, the only way that I've been able to work this out in my mind is to think of the second step uh, ascertaining the entailment as not at the level of experience but at the level of, of Yes. No, no, don't say if you had an inherently existent eye. Make it more general. Whatever is inherently existent, would it, this would have to be the case. Would it either have to be the same as yes. its basis of designation or utterly different? Yeah, right. So that's at the level of just logic. Well, I, I it does right. start out. It um, does start like, out as, sorry, I'm interrupting. Well, I guess I don't, I just don't see that experience comes into play there. Yeah, I don't know as I said it did. Um, and I, I think it's, it starts out very intellectual. And becomes an intellectual excursion in which in time you get a lot of conviction. Uh, but doesn't come out of uh, experience 
except with things like whatever exists is either singular or plural. You know, there's some foundation in experience like that. But not deeply felt uh, emotions as with the first step. But things pop into my, my mind when I go to that second step that aren't utterly the same or utterly different, which is why I have trouble going on to the third step, you know, like Siamese twins or something, you know? Things yeah. that are the same or as in Well, in... in uh, their own presentation, right, they, with, with regard to different, for instance, they posit pot and, and even pumba, which is the Tibetan word for pot, as different. These are, are their own categories of different. But they posit pot and its impermanence is different. That doesn't mean different entity. <coughs> they posit pot and pillar as different entities. Which one am I forgetting? They posit pot and clay as different but related in its clay, related causally. Now, when they get to this different, within the context of inherent existence, they say unrelatedly different. These three, the first three, are different within being one entity. So that they have a richness, being able to talk about phenomena that are different but are one entity. Oh, sorry, folks. I don't know what excuse I can make for that one. Guess I won't try. Partly it's impermanence. Part and its emptiness. Also, I don't mean empty of fluid, but its emptiness of inherent existence. They're all one entity, but different. Now this richness of vocabulary gets dropped out when you consider inherent existence. Why? Either because it's a trick, or say, you know, I always choose some stupid thing like, I do not inherently exist because I'm not a chair or a table. Yeah. <clears throat> Idiotic to come to the conclusion that I don't exist the way I appear just because I'm not a chair or, an, or, an, or a table. But it begins looking like that, just as idiotic. Unless you make some connection between how you appear in these rules. And of course, making that connection may be the conversion to some sort of stupidity. Or it may be the penetration of something that would be required if we did exist the way we appear, or if these phenomena existed the way they appear. Yes? Wouldn't a third way to approach it be to look at the definition of inherent and understand that inherent means without basing itself upon anything else, so that something would have to be either one in the same I don't think so. I think in that case you're talking about the, um, for instance, some people think 
that, I mean, yeah, there are statements like this, but um, that inherent existence means independence of causes. Oh, independence from causes? Well, if, if inherent existence meant independence from causes, then to merely realize that that cup is caused, right, would mean that you realized its emptiness. It's a consequence of inherent existence that the object would have to be independent of causes. It's a consequence. But to realize that it's dependent on causes doesn't necessarily mean that you've understood emptiness. It can, for some people, lead to that understanding. It can, for some people, imply, what do you say, even prove emptiness when they can put it together. But the two aren't the same. To realize that something is dependent on causes or is not independent of causes is not the realization of emptiness. Some people think that to re then all of the people in the low vehicle, low vehicle systems uh, would have realized the most profound emptiness of the consequentialist system. Well, maybe they have, but the consequentialist system then would be completely fall apart. Some people think that to realize impermanence is to realize emptiness. Well, to realize impermanence is a great shock and empties out a whole lot of garbage in the mind that, you know, where you're planning for this, like for this very same Jeffrey Hopkins to retire. Very same. You know, and, and conceiving of myself as being just this being who existed before, rather than seeing it as constantly changing. It's even, it's said to be terrifying, etc., etc. <coughs> but the, the realization of impermanence is not realization of emptiness. Emptiness is still deeper. Don't you use emptiness and dependency as a tool to understand emptiness? You do. And you have to understand the connection. So merely to understand that things are dependent on causes in some systems means that things do inherently exist. In this system, it means they do not inherently exist. You see? So it depends on putting these two together, seeing the implications of dependence on causes. So I think that it all hinges on your um, experience of the first step and developing a, and on the basis of that experience and developing experience with the second step, you know, that begins very intellectually, where you at some point see that this type of solidity would be limited to these possibilities. And that if you could undermine these possibilities, you would undermine the uh, such an inherently existent object. So what happens then and we're getting close to the uh, one of the, I think, question from you last time. Um, was it from you on the, or on uh, the other? So you have to then go through reason <coughs> to prove to yourself, it would be like somebody, uh, is it like somebody going through reasonings and so forth and getting to the point of giving up smoking or something you're addicted to? And thus superficial reasonings would not work. It has to be something that you know, there's usually some point at which the, it really gets through to you. 
uh, or cases where you're presented with counter evidence over years, and then somehow the message gets through. So the, the reasonings, again, cannot be applied in a rote way. They would have to be ones that shook you up. I was about smoking. I never smoked, really. I just smoked cigars and smoked cigarettes very little. But where it got through to me was, was over in the medical center and, and with a Tibetan doctor, and they showed a slide of a heart tissue that was black with uh, smoke. And it was like, you know, it really sealed it for me. Heart I wasn't tissue. going to smoke. Heart tissue, not lung tissue. You see, because it was heart tissue, I was struck. Lung tissue, OK. <laughs> <laughs> that won't stop me from smoking. <laughs> You know, what sorts of argu arguments, what sort of experiences will actually uh, change an attitude such that it will affect you in the midst of uh, very complicated behavior, right? Very whatever behavior. Wouldn't be the actual experience, I mean, you saw the heart tissue, but what about being told that you have a cancer? I mean, that would, that might shake you. God, I, it would, but I'd, I'd want to have the, <laughs> the lesson before that. <laughs> yes. It seems that this is different in some way, that there isn't any evidence. You can't say in cases of evidence where you've shown something that changes your mind, but here there's nothing you can show. You, there's no picture of emptiness. You can say, this is it, see? To, change, to give you that conviction. Well, what's interesting on that is Maitreya, in his Uttara Tantra, um, it's in the first chapter, toward the end of the first chapter, says something like, if uh, reality didn't exist, meaning the emptiness of inherent existence didn't exist, we wouldn't be prompted even to seek liberation. That this suggests that there's something uh, disturbing uh, that, because. yes, that, that reality impinges on us more than we think. I'm speaking from a Buddhist point of view, of course. Um, for instance, the disappearance of this I who was so angry. Um, I'm not saying that this always happens, because I mean, often with me, if it's in a situation of desire, and, the, and I, I find that the object of desire isn't suitable, I just go and look for another one rather than investigate something about desire. Um, but I think more with anger, it disappears at some point. And unless you're extremely proud, it's, there's some you know, minimally disturbing quality left. I'm proud too, so <laughs> make up reasons. There were good reasons. <laughs> That's a nice thing that Dalai Lama said. Is it during the talk last night? You can tell me what it is. He said uh, anger is senseless, silly. That's no point. Which one? Was it, was it on Nightline or on the other one? I think no, I think it was during the talk, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I took out of the talk. That's what really hit me in the talk. Someone, I think it was in regard to the question about whether Tibetans should ever consider So these reasonings are intended to draw you in
I mean, isn't it like Marx, uh, what did he write? His great work? Das Kapital. Das Kapital. Um, in order to cause people to investigate their situation and challenge an accepted view. I'm not saying, I'm not saying Marx is right or something. Right? Or in this case, the view is internal. So did you find that any of the reasonings uh, worked at all for you? I'm sure I, you know, on the flip side of that question, did you find that any of the readings were utterly ridiculous? You could point to some, couldn't you, or not? Some that didn't work? Yes? Um, I found that a lot of them worked, and I conceptually, of course, understood them. And I was like, oh, well, I've got it all now. But um, I wondered if you felt just like with, the, with seeing the heart or if you watch someone close to you die of AIDS, if that would change your behavior, if you need some sort of incident or there needs to be some inspiration for you to even take these to heart. I mean, I read them and I'm interested in it, and it's something that I've been interested in for a long time, so I've sat and thought about it. But do you, do you believe that people need some inspiration to even begin to read these? Because I could see if you just pulled someone out of Cabo Hall and said, you know, look at this, think about this, they would just, it would be very easy to dismiss all of it. I think it's true. The circumstances for being uh, willing to be impacted, not willing, uh, or willing, or, no, or just, just that one is no. impacted. Yeah, I'm very much so. And thus, there are many practices. Uh, it's said that it has to be a person of great merit, meaning there have to be a lot of virtuous activity, or there have to be many other activities. Uh, that would uh, that'll open up the way for being impacted. That's true. So, what are some of the ones um, that didn't work at all? One that was, seemed difficult was seeing before was like compared to a collection of things. I mean, how different you are from. Oh yeah! Before we do collection, I keep putting you off. <laughs> Pretty soon it'll be the end of the class. <laughs> Sorry. Different. Where is where is different discussed? The uh, page. <coughs> Some of the reasonings were built on on an assumption that there are former and later lives, right? Was there one that was um, What else is said in meditation on emptiness with regard to difference? This isn't enough. You need the sevenfold reasoning. Um, dependence, that the self depends on the aggregates. Uh, that the aggregates depend on the self. What are, I mean, this is simply that declaring that the inherently different must be unrelated. If the self and mind and body are unrelated, right, then you should be able to have yourself get rid of mind and body. Frankly, sometimes when I get really angry, I think I could remove mind and body and myself would still be there. I mean, wouldn't this be a uh, person believing in a soul and not mind? Yes. There's an instance of a Jaina who was studying in Dharamsala in North India with a Tibetan and got down to this point and, and they cleared away mind and body and he found that self. And then he got up and he thanked the teacher, he says, I found myself and left. 
Right. <laughs> because I mean, the rea- they're, they're, I would think someone believing in a soul, their yes. response to this would be, well, if you if you're still believing that there is no apparently existing stuff yes. that is different, yes. then you just haven't seen it. So. Yes. Now, what? I, the tack I take on this is that the self that they're talking about is the self that goes to the movies and does this and ah. does that. And that sort of a self, unconnected to mind and body, is, is unreasonable. But in the, for instance, in Hindu systems where you, where you take it as a given that reality exists, and you go through and you say it's not this, not this, which is what this is doing. Not this, not this, not this, not that. After a while, when you when you clear away all of these, and and you just get used to, I, I think what happens is your mind no longer scatters to these objects because you're saying it's not this, and you're looking for it. You see, and then in time, it Brahman reality then is allowed to manifest because you're not filling your mind with all these other things. Now, interestingly enough, here, when you don't find it this way, this same other, both, you know, blah, 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 whatever, um, same, different, this way dependent, that way dependent, possessing in the two forms, collection, and not shape, not shape, not collection, not, 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 again, then something gels out of, in a sense, out of that. There's this non-finding. So it's, it sounds like it's the, it, it ends up being the perspective which, which we begin it with. So yes. Hindu would probably, or some Hindus would probably come in there and do this, exactly the same thing and find Brahman, or Atman. Yeah, something quite similar and find Brahman. Right. right. And, a Buddhist would come in there and do the same thing and, and find, find emptiness. Right. Then it's interesting to look at descriptions of emptiness, descriptions of Brahman, and see if there are similarities, despite the fact that the systems are, are so opposed to each other. Or to look in highest Yoga Tantra at the fundamental innate mind of clear light, which is greatly associated with emptiness, and look at Brahman and see if there's some. Uh, what, what similarities there are. Because it seems that they would agree that the Atman is not the one that goes to the movies. And yes. And things like that. So yes. That, I don't think that would be That's true. not what this fellow was concerned about. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. In, in Zen, for instance, there's the language also in, in Yingma of... Um, realizing your own face. Now what's face then? Face is some sort of identity, your real identity. And whereas this talk is about your discovering emptiness. So why is there all this talk about emptiness? It, it seems that one needs to take a lot of negative medicine negative meaning negating medicine, that that this thing about which I'm getting so excited and so forth, depending on how large or small my salary is and this and that, is just under analysis can't be found. There is some Jeffrey Hopkins who gets his salary and puts it in his bank, right? It's not this one who's excited and worried about it. It's just plain not findable and that that medicine has to be taken. And so you have to get to look, 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 and not be looking for something positive in place of it. Wouldn't you say that when you mention about the face, or maybe what they talk about Atman, has to come out after you find that emptiness, that space, that, that's what allows that to come out? Yeah, I mean, even Mahapanditas are called Danyi Chembo, uh, Mahatma, great Atmans, great selves. But, um, yeah, okay. 
Now, with regard to the collection. The collection of this, where are you going to find the collection? Is it the first page? No. no. The second page? No. no. And you have to do it like this. The third page? No. Fourth page? No. no. If you want to do this meditation, begin it with page one. And carefully go through all the way. Don't read it. Otherwise, take you a long time. All the way to page whatever. And get no. I don't, maybe don't do it with this thing. <laughs> you know, think, ah, doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the collection isn't the first page. Collection isn't the second. You know, where are you going to find the collection? All of them together. Oh, the all. Is the first page the all? Is the second page the all? And you get some, you get a little press to find some other word. And remember, so then you stay in this space like condition where you haven't found the object in order to get the message. <laughs> Oh. The assignment for next time is uh, in the handout, 20, in the, this thing, 27 to 38, in Deity Yoga 19 to 27, and 103 to 114. Yeah. Well, no, it's because it's analytical. Yeah. Because it's analytical. 